Um, obviously, getting to be at the moment second place, I mean, that, that's an achievement in itself. Why are you standing? Why do you think you've got what it takes rather than people who served in the great offices of state over the past three years? Yeah. I mean, I have served in great offices of state, um, but I have been uh, uh, in a junior ministerial role. Boris brought me back in to help the country through the pandemic and I was very happy to, to do that and serve. But we are really at both a inflection point for our country and also entering some very, very difficult times. I think we have to be honest uh, to people about that. We're going to have a very difficult time this, this autumn. Uh, we've got to really wrap our arms around families and support businesses through some pretty choppy waters. I also think, although a lot of work has been done behind the scenes on capitalising on the opportunities of us leaving the regulatory orbit of the EU, the public really want to see us deliver on their vision, uh, both at the referendum when they voted for it, but also the, the mandate that they gave us. And I think I'm best placed to do that. I, I was a Brexiteer. Uh, I am passionate about the opportunities that now lie ahead of us. I want us to capitalise on them fast. We've got to pick up the pace. But I also think I'm really well placed to deal with these difficult issues. My economic policy is very different from the other candidates. I've in in called, what way? I've been called the Goldilocks candidate apparently Can't this evening. <laughs> um, I do have Goldilocks, but uh, I think... Rishi is obviously very prudent and cautious, but I think uh, it, the path he is going on could lead to real stagnation in the economy. And then some of my other colleagues are coming out with policies slashing expenditure, slashing taxes now. This contest is not the time to do that. And I think what we need to be focused on is growth and competition. And we do need to, I've announced some, some policies that I think will alleviate some cost of living issues. There's more we would have to do this autumn. But what we really need to be focused on is turbocharging the economy, stopping inflation and stopping us tipping into a recession. So, a bit like Rishi Sunak, no tax cuts. No, I am making some. So I'm making some uh, tax cuts to VAT. I'll halve VAT on fuel and that should save the average family about £10 every time they fill up. And I'm also going to look at uh, lower and middle income uh, thresholds uh, on personal taxation and, and get them to rise with inflation. And then I'm going to be talking about tomorrow some things that we're doing to it really stop us tipping into recession, recession some incentives uh, to really help the economy. But I think we need to be cautious in this contest. But that doesn't sound very radical. I mean, if, you, if you're portraying yourself as the change candidate, I mean, there are a couple of others doing that too. Somebody who, although you've been a minister in the Johnson government, you weren't in the cabinet. Do you not need to provide something more, a, a little bit more juice for Tory voters to sort of make them think, well, she's very different? I'm the they know what they're blinking well doing <laughs> candidate. The others will obviously try and secure votes. They'll try and uh, put up flares for particular caucuses. I'm going through this contest in the way that I would govern the country. It, this is not the time to be making radical tax policies and promises. And I think that anyone that is cutting expenditure in some of the extreme ways that we've heard from other candidates doesn't really understand what's facing us this autumn. People are crying out for some delivery and some competence and for people to grip the issues that really matter to them. Cost of living is one, access to primary health care and dentists is another. I've got a plan of how we're going to do that. But you've been in the government for the last few years, as I say, not, not in the cabinet. You, you remained a minister in the Johnson government right to the end. I mean, you still are a minister. Yeah. Um, why didn't you resign last week? Because I think my personal view was that it was the cabinet that were going to, to, to trigger that if it was going to happen. And Did you I, want it to happen? Uh, well, I would, I would always want there to be some stability. But I think that the, the Prime Minister was given a lot of chances to try and turn things around and it, it became apparent it wasn't going to, uh, that wasn't going to work. One of the reasons why I stayed in was because I think we have a responsibility to, uh, to govern, to actually get things done. I'm signing uh, 
this week and next some new trade deals, for example. But also, you, we just need with. to... So I'm doing state deals with the United States. So uh, that will mean financial services, legal services, architecture, engineering. Uh, we'll be able to, to have mutual recognition of qualifications, procurement... Well, they're, not, the they're not what most people would describe as proper trade deals, though, are they? They're not tariffs, but actually it's pretty substantial. Um, so to give you an example, uh, um, a, a lawyer or an accountant... Uh, once these deals come into fruition, we'll find it easier to work in Oklahoma than, than uh, someone from Tennessee. Why do you think Boris Johnson didn't put you in his cabinet? Because you were defence secretary when yes. he was uh, first prime minister. I think a lot of people were very surprised that he didn't keep you in his cabinet then. So I didn't support him. Um, I think he has a lot of good qualities uh, and he did us a great service in getting us out of a very difficult political situation but he was entitled to to pick his team and uh, if you remember at the time I was uh, you know I, uh, I I wasn't sniffy about it at all I made it very clear that I would support him and I hope he feels that I have done that um in the Brexit referendum, and a lot of people have been contacting me, wanting me to ask you this question. In the Brexit referendum, you said that Turkey was about to join the EU and that we would have no veto over that, leading possibly to 75 million Turks uh, coming into the EU. Now, that was not true, but even when the truth was pointed out to you, you didn't apologise for saying something which was untrue. I actually stand by that, Ian, because, well, the short answer is the British public didn't have a say. The longer answer is it was government policy. David Cameron... It was not true to say that we didn't have a veto. We did. There, there is a provision for a veto, but we could not have used it because Why? David Cameron gave an undertaking uh, that he would support uh, their accession. And having given that undertaking to a NATO country, he would not have been able to walk away. Obviously... He's gone. Uh, there's uh, there's possibilities for change in the future, but I think it was disingenuous of him to claim that the UK could have vetoed it when it was his own policy, and he'd given that. Well, it, but it could have Turkey. vetoed it. I mean, he could have easily changed policy, or a different prime minister could have come in and had a different policy. But the fact of the matter is. Uh, legally, we were perfectly entitled to veto Turkey's accession. The Prime Minister wasn't, and the British public wouldn't have had a say. OK. Um, the, the, there's been um, criticism of you among some of your colleagues. They say that, uh, you're, that intellectually you're not up to it. Now, why do you think people say that? I mean, I've got my own theory, which I'll tell you in a minute, but let's <laughs> see if it coincides with yours. Well, um, there was another woman that that was said about, and it worked out all right for her. That was Margaret Thatcher. Are you comparing yourself to Margaret Thatcher? I'm comparing myself to a lot of women who are underestimated. Do you think that you have suffered in your political career through either overt or covert misogyny? Because I think one of the reasons people say that, and maybe the only reason, is because you happen to have blonde hair. Uh, well, I don't know. You'll have to interview, you'll have to interview them, Ian. But you, you know, know this is said about you, don't you? Well, look, it's said about a lot of women. I think a lot of women are underestimated. And actually, when women come forward and are interested in standing for Parliament, uh, quite often their skill sets are really high, but their, their confidence is very low. And I think it is because people tend to dismiss people on the way they look. Uh, they don't know about their, their backgrounds. Sometimes they don't get some of the chances that, that other people might. But it hasn't stopped me in... Um, can you give me a guarantee that you won't do what your campaign manager, Andrea Leadsom, did and drop out if you come second and, and effectively deny Conservative Party members a vote? I will not do that, no. Um, I think it, the, that she had very good reasons and for, for doing what she did. Um, but no, I think it's really important that we, we give our electorate in the Conservative Party a choice and also we test candidates as well because people are going into a you know a difficult job and they need to be tested. Um, let's talk a bit more about the cost of living and economic growth because as you say if we're going to if people's um, if the people are going to have more money in their pockets it's not just going to be through tax cuts it's got to be because the economy is getting bigger now one thing you haven't mentioned so far is corporation tax which Rishi Sunak is putting up from 19p to 25p now some of the other candidates are promising to reverse that yeah. what's your policy so my policy towards things like corporation tax and also capital gains tax I 
I think we do need to send a flare up for, for business and we need to get people excited about the possibilities here. But my principle will be on competition. We have to compete with what other nations have on offer. I'm not going to make tax policy on those issues in this contest. I think that's irresponsible. Um, but that is my guiding principle. But it's your instinct to cut corporation tax because that would be a to, way of generating economic yes, growth. I think it? we have to have an environment that competes with what others have on offer. Um, and, but it, it sits, tax cuts sit within a wider economic framework. And just for business, for example, small businesses, because quite often we talk about big businesses, simplifying what we ask them to do. I think the Federation of Small Businesses were saying that the, the costs of tax compliance for a company, small company, is about five grand a year. Mm. Um, there's lots more we can do to save them money without spending public money. Right. I think we should go to some calls, I don't you? I do too. Um, let's go to Mark, who's on the world. Hello, Mark. Hi there, Ian. Hi. Hi. What would you like to ask, um, Mark? My question, okay, my question to Penny, and I'll qualify this question. Um, I'm an electrical engineer. I'm also an economic student with the Open University. On the 5th of September, if Penny is successful, she will walk into a crisis because a week before, the price of the cap on energy will have been announced. Now, with Germany currently using 40% coal because they are trying to come off offline from Russia and Russia may well cut them off, we are going to all in Europe going to be scrabbling around for gas and energy to get ourselves through the winter. Penny, I'm a huge supporter of yours. I've been uh, quote tweeting you for the last week, hundreds, in fact, thousands of times. What are your thoughts? Well, look, we, we, well, thank you for the tweets, by the way. That's very kind. We, we are going to have a very difficult autumn and winter, which is why I'm not making some of the promises other candidates are, because I think we will need to do some more things this autumn to, to help people. In terms of their household bills, my personal view, I'm not committing to things, but I, the sorts of things I would be looking for are, are things like the standard charge, for example. There are there are parts of the country where the standard charge, even if people aren't using uh, 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 much uh, energy, is still enormous. And so I, I think we need to, to look at billing. We need to look at actually how we can alleviate some of those costs. There's still some of those structural issues that we, that we need to address. Uh, but in terms of our own resilience, um, I think we should be... Uh, we should be increasing local supply, uh, and that includes gas. Uh, but I also think we need to be making investments. I'm very I'm pro nuclear. I would uh, accept fracking, um, and uh, I think we want to make ourselves as resilient as possible, and uh, you, that will help us with costs. Do you still believe in net, net, net zero? Yes, I do. But I think we need to be realistic about how we're going to get there. We have enormous pressures on us to reach it by a particular time, and there are implications on that. But where I think we need to do more, particularly on uh, consumer issues, is really incentivize some innovation. The only way we're really going to get people to adopt things is if they want to, and they, it's useful and helpful to them, and it saves them money. And I think we need a lot more innovation to get us where we want to go. Mark, thank you very much. Let's move on to Nicola, who's in Leicester. Nicola, hello. What would you like to ask Penny? Oh, hi. Um, well, my question is about Penny's record on women's rights. So, Penny, when you were Minister for Women and Equalities, you wanted to change the law that would allow any man to change the sex on his birth certificate to say that he'd been born female. No doctors, no surgery, just on his say-so alone. But when Liz Trust took over... She said no, that checks and balances must stay to safeguard women's rights. So, Penny, my question is, if you become PM, would you reverse this and make sex self-ID law to let anyone swap the sex on their birth certificate? So, I've never supported self-ID. There are some people that socially transition, 
But what we were looking at was the Gender Recognition Act, and it's a process that people go through. There was clamour to separate that out from healthcare, and I disagreed with that. So what you've said, Nicola, is not a reflection of my position at any time. I think that we needed to do some things to make it easier for people to access services. The waiting lists to access services were a couple of years. There were things that we could do to help people actually have their, their documents like driving licenses and passports uh, actually in the same gender. Uh, terrible problems for people when that, that didn't happen. But you have not um, characterised my position. And I support also um, women-only spaces. I, I like the fact that in England we have uh, refuges for, for women and uh, trans women. I don't support the, the scheme in Scotland where all refuges have to provide a, a um, places for trans people. But you, you did say in the House of Commons that trans women are women. Do you still believe that? In law, uh, some are. I'm a woman. <laughs> I'm a biological woman. Uh, if I had a mastectomy uh, in future years, I would still be a woman. I'm a woman in every cell of my body. I'm also legally a woman. And people who have been through uh, the gender uh, recognition process, the gender reassignment, some people will have a birth certificate reissued to them in their new gender. And in law, they will be in their new gender. And when you're writing law about those people, you have to take that into account. That doesn't mean they're identical to me. And a lot of the issues that you're hearing now, I was talking about three or four years ago. Um, I set up an inquiry into the, a lot of young girls being moved into trans services, for example. I also raised the sports issue, which is something I feel very strongly about because in my naval career, I compete against men and I always come last. And, and you're a professional diver. Well, not professional, <laughs> uh, Ian. You're being very kind there. But, but so... Um, but a lot, but of, a lot of your opponents, particularly in this contest, are bringing this subject up to try and damage you. Yeah. And, and they have, I think, Sola Braveman said the other day, that when you were bringing in some gender equality legislation, you insisted on the phrase people who are pregnant in no. the legislation. Again, I'm, a, I'm sorry to say that is. I'm just not, so yeah. telling you what no, the no, accusations are. No, no, I'm not criticising you, Ian. I'm just sorry that this is the kind of thing some of my opponents are doing. That, that is not true. Um, I had no input onto the drafting of that bill. It was given to me uh, literally the day before it was going to be put through the House. It had been cleared by Cabinet. I had no input into the drafting. But in my stewardship of the bill through the House, I put uh, uh, allowed amendments in that amended the bill to but get you, rid you of the But you didn't put in an amendment yourself, though. That, those were amendments no. from people in the House of Lords, no, I believe. they were. But I suggested to the drafters that they, they put those words in uh, and uh, they wanted to actually wait for amendments from the Lords because they like to do that, give concessions to the Lords. But I was very happy with that. And what we did was we used the word mother because it's a female word, um, but it's also legally correct. Nicola, are you reassured? No, I'm not, because Penny was the women, uh, women's minister at the time when GRA reform, GRA reform was proposed. And it was clear that the government wanted self-ID at that point. So, um, you know, you were the minister, Penny, um, that led that consultation. So I'm, I'm absolutely surprised to hear this, that you now so, did not Nicola, support self-ID. So, Nicola, um, again, that's not correct. Um, so the, the Gender Recognition Act was, uh, and the reforms that were proposed were, were under Justine Greening, uh, and uh, Justine was minister, and then uh, Amber Rudd was the minister, and then I was the minister. And I took the consultation through, um, but we didn't make any decisions about it. But, I, but Nicola, I do understand why this is such a critical issue for women. Um, it is something that I completely understand the points that you raise and why uh, someone like you would want reassurance from me that I support women-only spaces um, and that I 
don't want any rolling back of women's rights. Every stage of my career, I have fought for women's rights. And if you look at my record in the Equalities Office, I did that. I shifted our focus onto the real issues facing women, women who are trapped in poverty and low pay because of legacy benefit systems, many other things. And I produced a roadmap for women okay. at every stage of their life. Uh, Nicola, thank you. Uh, Will is in Moulton in North Yorkshire. Hello, Will. What would you like to ask? Uh, Hi, Tony. I feel a bit treacherous for abandoning a fellow North Yorkshireman, but I am inclined to vote for you in the members' ballot. My main concern is around you. young people in housing. I think that mm. the government don't want to talk about it because it doesn't appeal to them. If somebody who appeals to young people at the electorate, what are you going to do? Because if we get, get your young people into housing, we are going to you know, ensure that the next generation never vote Conservative. No, I... I think you raise an incredibly important issue and we, we don't probably have enough time to go into everything that we need to do. But actually the issues in terms of how many houses are being built are different in different parts of the country. But just let me tell you one problem that I would very quickly solve. For a lot of young people, uh, it's very expensive renting and they... they ideally want to be able to share accommodation but still have their own private space, a, a bedroom and a bathroom, but maybe have shared living space to help them save a, a deposit. And also just as young professionals live with, with other people um, and, and have a social network. Currently, things that are going on in the valuation office are preventing those developments from taking place because they're rebanding bedrooms as as new households so your council tax bill whether it's the tenant or the landlord that's uh, that's going to pay that it goes from a couple of thousand pounds to something like you know over 10 grand so there's little tweaks we can make to the system valuation office but many other areas that can actually help unlock some of these things but in the end can, I mean, can you make a commitment now that as Prime Minister you would not reshuffle your housing minister every year? Because it seems, I mean, housing for many young people, I think as, as Will would, would agree, is, is one of the, their touchstone issues at the moment, really, really important. And the Conservative Party is, through, throughout history has always encouraged home ownership. But you're never going to get a coherent housing policy when you have a different housing minister every no, year, are I'm, you? I mean, the, these are real problems. And part of my platform is not just what needs to happen, it's how we make mm. it happen. Having continuity, having people that are able to not just come up with ideas, but actually see them through is really important. And what we don't do currently is give our ministers of state really clear deliverables about what they what they have to do. She says speaking as a minister of state. Speaking as a minister of state, <laughs> yes. Um, what, we, what the civil service does is it's interested in what topics we should go into bat for and at the dispatch box. We've got to do some serious machinery of government reforms if we're going to be able to deliver for people. Uh, Will, thank you for that. So let's go to Kevin, who's in Southwark. Hello, Kevin. Yeah, good evening. Um, thanks for putting me on. My question, very briefly, is that you have consistently uh, voted in the comments against paying higher benefits to those unable to work due to disabilities. And are you likely to change that voting pattern if you become PM? So a lot of the changes we've made to disabilities actually have increased the amount of benefits that people have had. Um, but I think what we need but to do is... people don't, fi don't feel don't this on the ground, do they? they you, you can say, well, we, in all, disabled benefits have gone up 20% in, in whatever time. And people say, yeah, but I haven't had that. Why is that? No, I, I think that um, there are... Uh, it added to that, it's also some of the processes that people have to go through to access these benefits, which are quite traumatising in, in some cases. I'm very keen to see what more that we, we can do to use data that we already have to A, reduce the trauma of going through some of those processes, but also enable the pots of money that we currently have to be used better. So access to work, for example, which uh, many disabled people might, uh, might access, uh, you can't use that uh, if you're accessing other um, other benefits or schemes, motability and, and, and things like that. So I think there's lots more reform that we can do for that, but we, we need to get this right. Uh, we've done really well with getting disabled people uh, into work and addressing some of these issues, but I would be the first to say there's more for us to do. 
Let's do some quickfire questions to end up with. We could go on all night, judging by the number of calls that are coming in, but let's do some quickfire ones. Uh, yes or no answers. Scrap the online harms bill. No. Scrap the BBC licence fee. Evolve it, don't scrap it. Scrap the Channel 4 privatisation. No, Damien Collins is on my team and I trust his judgement. Restore DFID as a separate department. Of course, you were Secretary of State there, weren't you? Yeah, uh, I was Secretary of State there and no, I wouldn't bring DFID back. Why not? Because I think it is uh, it is fine in the uh, the Foreign Office and uh, it doesn't need to be a separate department. It, it In a way, it's... I mean, when I was actually Secretary of State in DFID, I used to go to the Foreign Office for, for prayers because I always felt we should be working as one team. Um, your worst mistake? Oh, dear. Well, I probably couldn't say it on air, Ian, even if oh, really? you call, call it. <laughs> oh, well, we've got plenty I've of made, time. I've made many, but I've always learned from them. OK. Um, say something nice about Keir Starmer. He's in opposition. Is that something nice? Can you not well, think of anything nicer than that? Well, no, he's a... You know, I'm sure he's a very decent fellow, but this is quick, quick fire. OK, all right. Um, what's your karaoke song of choice? In all honesty, it is um, Nancy Sinatra, These Boots Were Made For Walking, because <laughs> I, I, have, I can't sing. <laughs> and your sporting hero? Oh, my gosh, so many. Um, Kelly Holmes. OK. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on LBC. Um, it'd be very interesting to see the reaction to both of the interviews tonight with Indeed Zahawi and Penny Mordant. Um, hopefully we will talk again before the end of this campaign. Coming up in a moment, it's Tuesday's edition of Cross Question. I'll be joined by Conservative MP Alberto Costa, Kate Andrews, Andrews Economics Editor of The Spectator, Alex Salmon, former First Minister of Scotland, and Ashmal Mazrua, who is a good friend of the programme and an imam. So they'll be taking your calls. We've cleared the board, so it's empty. So if you want to ask them a question, now is the time to dial 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's three minutes past eight. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, eight candidates have made it into tomorrow's first round of voting in the race to become Prime Minister. They all got the backing of at least 20...